And I would ask that you would turn, please, in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. And I want to read verses 18 to the end. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. <clears throat> Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. Amen. Believe it or not, this is the first time in many years I have preached on marriage. I have applied many sermons to marriage, but I have not preached specifically of God's intention and design for marriage. Now there's always a bit of risk in doing this. I have a wife and she knows how I'm doing as a husband. The good news is that she's in the nursery. <laughs> the bad news is she's going to get a copy of the sermon. And I'm going to do everything I can to prevent that. I know this is a mixed audience when it comes to marriage. Uh, you may have been married and you are now a widow or widower and it makes you sad. You may have been married and you are divorced and it makes you mad. You may be divorced and remarried and that makes you glad. Some of you are single by choice. Some of you are still waiting and hoping. Marriage, you see, is God's plan for most people, but not for everyone. But a good number of you are married, and there's always the hope that something I say can encourage you to ask God for more in your marriage. And remember, marriage does not fail. People fail. And where you have failed or will fail, whether married or single, there is a God of grace who can lift you up and heal every hurt. And for those of you who are younger and looking ahead to marrying someday, you need to hear about what God says in his word about this. The most important decision you will ever make after placing your faith in Jesus Christ is the choice of a marriage partner. And here is where it is tougher on us than on Adam, at least we think it is. After all, there's lots of people to pick from. from. He didn't have much choice. He was willing to marry the first girl that came along. And he did. And he was not disappointed. We've been looking at the foundational principles in Genesis which are necessary for us to develop a Christian world view. There are four in the first two chapters. You are made in the image of God. As Psalm 8 says, you are made a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned with glory and honor. You are not an animal. Your significance lies in the fact that God made you. 
You are given dominion over this earth. We are called to care for this earth, fill it and subdue it. Again, the psalmist says, we have been given dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things up under our feet. And we are given a day of rest. We do not need to wear ourselves out. The Lord's day is given to us as a gift that we might rest in Jesus. And now here's the fourth principle. God has designed a unique relationship of marriage between one man and one woman, equal in personhood with clearly defined and complementary roles, called to live under God's authority. And I'm going to suggest to you that for the man, it is loving leadership, and for the woman, it is loving um, submission as a helpmate for the husband, which comes out very clearly in our passage. Let me give you a couple of points from the text, and then I'll seek to apply it, all right? And I will speak as plainly as possible. First of all, when God created the man, something is not good. In Genesis 1, God creates the man and the woman in his image. That image is reflected in both of them together. But in chapter 2, we take a more detailed look. Adam is made first from the dust of the ground, but there is a time lapse between the creation of Adam and the creation of Eve. God puts Adam in the garden to care for it. He is to obey God. God tells him that he has free reign over this beautiful home. But he must not eat of one tree in the middle of the garden. And this is followed by God's statement, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Verse 18. The man is good. What is not good is that he is alone. He can delight in God and enjoy the garden home. But just like for you and me, when something is wonderful to experience and you experience it alone, it is different than if you would experience it with someone like you. Something is missing. God needs to put the finishing touch on his creation. It's not yet complete. The second thing that stands out in the passage is that God creates from Adam's side a woman to complete the man. In order to do that, God has the animals come before him that he might name them. Now, why does he do this? Well, he does it for a couple of reasons. First, Adam's dominion is set forth. These animals are in his charge. He is, as it were, taking inventory. But more than that, he is to see that they have no need, but he does. As he names the animals, he sees that they will not fu fulfill him. They are, after all, just animals. They are not made in God's image. They are not like him. Perhaps he saw them in pairs and realized that he was alone. God did this to show him that he needed someone like him. It is then that God puts Adam to sleep. He makes the woman from him, and he made the woman for him. God knew what he was doing. God planned for that marriage, and God brought the woman he needed to him. And he knew she was someone special, and he praised God. I don't know what Adam said when he saw Eve for the first time. But it must have been something like, wow. She completes him. Now he names her woman. She was taken from his side for his good, and now there is both a man and a woman, intelligent, beautiful, blessed by God, and ready to replenish the earth with the next generation of image bearers. Now you say they were the only two. They didn't have much choice. How do we do it when there's seven billion people in this world? Well, God still works the same way today. Yeah, there are millions of people to choose from, but, but God is still the author of marriage. He is, it is not by accident that you married the one that you married. He is sovereign over that choice. 
If you are seeking his will, and will, uh, he will lead you to the person he has for you, and it is every bit as much of a wonder as this first presentation of Eve to Adam. Marriage is God's good idea. He thought it up. He brings two people together according to his will, and there is a purpose and a design to it. And in this relationship, there is a one flesh union. Two people, but one flesh, completed by the other, not to be separated. Jesus quotes this passage in the New Testament and adds these words, therefore what God has brought together, let not man separate. This is the way it was before there was sin. We know that sin affects every area of life, including your marriage. Some of you had good marriages that ended too soon. In God's plan, he may have allowed for something to go wrong. You have, may have married in a time of rebellion against God. You, you may have married for the wrong reasons. You may even have said, I made a mistake. Perhaps you are mad at God for what happened, but let me say there are no mistakes. God is sovereign in your life, and I do know the gospel can bring sweetness to a sour marriage and put hope in a hopeless marriage. My own extended family has been recently rocked with marriage problems and breakups that are mystifying. As in every Tyson wedding, the, the, the marriage partner was properly vetted. And yet after years together of raising children, two of those marriages are at this point in the state of separation. And I'm sure that all of you can point to the same thing. God, God can restore a life rocked by a failed marriage. Some of you are testimony to that fact. I look back on my own marriage and see times when it could have taken a bad turn, and I have nothing to commend myself for. I can only give testimony to the grace of God. God can restore a wreck of a marriage. When you think that it is hopeless, it is not hopeless. Where sin abounds in a marriage or in a home, grace can superabound. God can use anything and everything, even our sin, to bring us out of despair and back to him. I know, I have seen it. Some of you can give testimony to this. When sin came into the world, God didn't change the rules. Marriage is under attack today, but marriage does not fail. People fail. And his plan is still the best that there is. God is still to be praised, and I will fight for marriage, and you ought to fight for it too. Let's look at some application of this for our own marriage. What is a Christian marriage supposed to look like? What help does this initial text in Scripture on marriage give us? Let me give you a few, a few realities. First of all, you are both, as husband and wife, equal in created glory. You are both made in the image of God. You are both heirs of eternal life. There's equal footing at the cross. You both have access through prayer and through the word of God to their heavenly father. There is no longer any male or female, slave or free, Jew or Greek at this point. We are one. John Piper says to be created in God's image, male and female, is to enjoy equality of personhood, equality of dignity. Mutual respect, harmony, complementarity, and a unified destiny. But secondly, you, you have unique responsibilities. This is what drives some people crazy. People will say that we are equal in every way. There are no differences. Well, let me tell you, there are differences besides the obvious physical differences. God made us differently, and it is good, and we celebrate those differences. You see, equality does not mean equivalency. Equality of personhood does not demand sameness of responsibilities. 
Everything the New Testament teaches about the roles and relationships between men and women spring from Genesis chapter 2. And again, any specific responsibilities that fall to the man as a man or to the woman as a woman is not the result of the fall of man, but the result of creation. And I'm not talking here about who mows the lawn or cleans the house or changes the diapers or pays the bills. Every couple can work out specifics according to their giftedness. My wife pays the bills so that she can be sure they get paid every month. But I do the taxes at the end of the year. Well, notice, what is different? What is different? Well, the man in Genesis chapter 2 is created first. Why did God create them the way he did? He could have created them at the same time from the same lump of clay, but he didn't. The Hebrew people knew that there was a special responsibility to the firstborn as the head or the leader in the family. The man has leadership responsibility in the home. He is to exercise loving leadership, not to be demanding or domineering. That's the effect of the fall, but the leadership principle comes before there was sin. That's what sin does. It, it leads to domination. The man is created first to be the leader. He may delegate responsibility to his wife, but he is the leader. The headship or leadership spoken of here is only in the marriage relationship. It does not mean that all men are leaders of all women. In the New Testament, this rule is extended to the church. Paul uses the creation of man to argue male leadership, while at the same time recognizing the gifts of women in the church. To the office of elder is given the responsibility to lead, and to them, the church submits, both men and women who are not elders, submit as to the Lord. He is also accountable before God. The man is accountable before God for what happens in the home. Notice Adam was to be the leader in establishing a godly household. I say this because of verse 16 and 17 before I picked up the reading at verse 18. Adam is told about the forbidden tree. How did Eve know that there was a tree forbidden to them? when the devil tempted her later in chapter 3. Well, she heard it from Adam. It was his place and responsibility to set the moral tone in the home. And one of the problems that sin brings is that in most Christian homes, it is the wife who takes spiritual initiative and does the moral training, and the man is quiet or even absent altogether. And the challenge for the Christian wife is to help her husband take responsibility without usurping his place or bypassing him altogether. The great challenge and concern of a Christian wife is to encourage and respect her husband without nagging. And of course that's a Great struggle in every home. And ministry families have the same problems most of you do. In fact, ministers have a wonderful way of being able to tell other people how their home and their marriage should look while they fail at their own. Beth Ann and I had a huge struggle with family devotions, finding time to pray together, just as many of you do. And notice it is Adam who is questioned first by God. Again, this is in chapter 3, which we haven't looked at yet, but it's the woman who ate the fruit, and it is the man God speaks to. In verse 6, the man was with her, and he did not stop her when she took the fruit. In verse 9, 
God calls to the man, where are you? And in verse 11, have you eaten of the fruit I told you not to eat? God comes to him because God holds him accountable. She's not off the hook. She's responsible for what she did. She receives harsh judgment from God, but he is accountable for the failure in the home. The greatest need in the church and in the home today is for men to stand up and play the man. If men would take as much time in guiding their family morally and spiritually as they do in making money or making something in their wood shop or painting the house, the church would be in much better shape today. Satan attacks the woman first. He bypasses the man. He shows that he despises God's way by assaulting God's pattern for the home. Satan lured her into being the moral guardian of the garden. Satan did not tempt her because she was more gullible. To destroy God's order, he subtly deceives the woman and turns the man into what he wants the man to be. A withdrawn, silent, weak, and passive coward. And this is where he wins the battle today. Another important point from this passage. You men are to put your wife first. I'll tell you where this comes from. You are to honor her and praise her for her purity. You are not to allow other responsibilities to usurp this primary responsibility. After Adam says, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, Moses writes the commentary to those who are reading now when the human race has developed and grown a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh leave cleave and become one flesh don't skip over this you must stand up to anyone and everyone who may try to divide your loyalties or to divert your attention you are to leave father and mother and take up a new priority. You are no longer your parents' little boy. You men are to honor your parents, but you must never let parents' needs and parents' opinions shake you from putting her and her needs first. First you leave, you leave physically. You leave home and get a job. Then you cleave, you cleave emotionally. You tell her that your life is incomplete without her and that you need her more than anything else. Then you become one flesh sexually. Keep the order straight, please. Young people, I want to tell you bluntly and candidly, your body is to be kept off limits to anyone who would seek to change that order. We have people who are collecting welfare for children who have no father at home because mom became one flesh with a man before he would leave his parents and take responsibility to marry her. And you young men respect yourself and the girls you know enough to refrain from sexual activity before you are married. This is what God says. And everything in our culture says it can't be done. It's very hard to stay pure. Our culture is caving in under the weight of irresponsible living manifested in a sex-charged world that says, go for it. You can have sex without guilt and without sexually transmitted diseases. There are condoms, there are birth control pills and abortions to keep us safe along the way, but they don't keep us safe and our culture is falling apart. Our choices have consequences. Our God is calling us all to sexual purity, chastity outside of marriage, and faithfulness inside of marriage. You know what I discovered? Nobody ever died from not having sex. You know, we, we can. We can control ourselves. I never heard an autopsy report saying this poor man died because he didn't have sex. But you would think that it's 
you know, our next breath is dependent on it when you look at our culture. If you have failed, there is forgiveness. And God can restore you. I counseled a young couple several years ago. They were constantly fighting and they did not respect one another. And I began to realize that, that, that she was feeling a lot of guilt because of the fact that they were living together and she knew better because of her Christian background. And she was feeling guilty and she blamed him and they were constantly throwing up problems without really knowing what it was. And when I challenged them on the fact that they had been living together out of wedlock and that it was destroying, the, the, it was, it was destroying their marriage, I had them repent to each other and repent to God for what they were doing. And you know what happened? Their marriage got better. Not overnight, but it was restored to what God wanted it to be. There was forgiveness and there was healing for something that they really couldn't even put their finger on. The husband is to be the leader. Now the next question is, what is she to be? Well, she is to be, according to our text, a helper, suitable or fit for him. Now this does not mean that she is to be weak or passive and withdrawn. Suitable means equal and adequate the word helper means to be a counterpart, to correspond to his nature, to complement or complete him. A counterpart is to sing the harmony while he sings the melody. The Hebrew word to help here means to answer back, not to talk back as in giving back talk, but to give words back. This is what I hear you saying. To echo, to challenge, to respectfully question in order for him to carefully consider what he is doing. To be a helpmate also means one who fills his empty places. Now after church today, there is one empty place that's going to be filled by me, but I'm not talking about the stomach. The wife is to fill in what may be missing. This is not demeaning. You've heard of an author who has written a book and that he dies before it's finished, but one of his disciples or one of his students who knows him and who knows how he writes and who knows how he thinks finishes the book. Nothing demeaning about that at all. Or, or a composer who's, who's writing a wonderful piece of music dies before it's finished and one of his students finishes it. Or an artist is painting a great picture and he is unable to complete it and one of his students completes it. I have a nephew who's, a, who's an author. And one of the things he does is to serve as a ghostwriter for, for people that are better known uh, who can write stuff. and he. They come up with the idea and he writes it. And they meet together and they talk and he gets to know the person and he writes the chapters and they come together and again he says, yes, that's how I would say it. That's being a help suitable for the author. That's what you are to be for your husband. So celebrate the differences. Thank God for the gift God has given you in your marriage partner. Talk about what you may need to do to make some changes. Man, you might want to ask, am I being a moral leader? How can you help me to do that? Am I acting out of sinful patterns or out of a creation calling? And women, ask, am I respecting your place or am I usurping it? Am I a helper or am I working around you? And ask God to make your marriage what he intends it to be. And remember, Jesus Christ is the hope of your marriage. Your marriage is to be a reflection of the love of Christ for his bride, the church. Paul quotes from Genesis 2 in Ephesians chapter 5, A man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and his church. 
Every marriage is worth saving. It takes work and a strong conviction that the gospel can work to overcome sin in your marriage, but it is worth saving. This is the Christian mindset that, that's got to get inside of us and help shape our life. Do you see how Jesus fulfills every one of these basic principles that are found in Genesis 1 and 2? We are made in God's image. Jesus is the exact representation of God's being. We are given a charge to rule and subdue the earth, and Jesus Christ is the ruler and Lord over all, and one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. We are given a day to rest, and Jesus is our Sabbath rest. We are told to love and respect each other in our marriage, and he is the one who purchases a bride for himself. God, as it were, put his son to sleep through the agonies and death on the cross, and God took out of his side his son's wounded side, a bride. And when he awoke, he had won his bride. Every man is called to love his wife as Christ loves the church, willing to give his life for her and to purify her and to love her and to care for her as Jesus loves and cares for the church. Are you joined to him in faith? Turn to Christ and he will be your savior. And if you are joined to him by faith, nothing can separate you from that love. Is that the way you'll live and commit to live your married life that nothing, nothing will separate you? May God enable us to live for him in our marriages. And may they be a testimony to a God whose love and faithfulness can sweeten a sour marriage and make a good marriage even stronger. Amen? Will you pray with me? So, Lord, may you strengthen us and help us to this end with the love and faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ who loves his church be on display in our own marriages. Lord, we are weak and we are sinful and we need your help. We, we have failed, but would you take the, the broken pieces and make something good for the sake of your glory. In Jesus' name.